Hey, how's it going, everybody? It's W9FFF Ham Radio Dude, and I figured I would take a break from the Yezu videos and focus on what I believe is a excellent gift for Father's Day, especially if you're on a budget. Now, this could be a great birthday gift or any kind of gift in general. For me, I just had the parts laying around the house, so I figured let's jump in and show you how to build a ham clock. And so today we're going to talk about a few things. What is a ham clock? What parts are needed to build the ham clock? How do you configure and install the ham clock? And what can you actually do with this? I'm also going to talk about some of the issues I ran into personally, because I think that those will be very valuable learning tools for anybody trying to learn Linux or just build this ham clock. To get started, you're going to want a Raspberry Pi. Now, the Raspberry Pi that I'm using is Raspberry Pi 3B, and what that means is, is there's built-in wireless technology. Uh, you could use a Pi Zero, or you could use any Raspberry Pi that you want, but you need to make sure that you're going to have internet access. And what I mean by that is, you could plug into the Ethernet port, but you got to make sure that it stays around the router. The reason I'm using wireless is then my ham clock is semi-portable, with the exception of needing to be plugged into power, which you could probably use a power brick if you wanted to. So I'm choosing the Raspberry Pi 3B. Next up, we're going to need an SD card, which is going to go on the back of the Raspberry Pi right into here. So it is a micro SD card. And in the description below, I will provide a link that shows a list of compatible SD cards for the Raspberry Pi. In this scenario, I'm using a Patriot 32 gigabyte SD card. Now that you picked out your Raspberry Pi and your micro SD card, you need to decide on a video output. And what I mean by that is you could use the HDMI that's built into the Raspberry Pi and put it out to an old TV that you have laying around, and that would be completely fine. Or you could do something like I'm going to do, and you could use a 7-inch LCD touchscreen from Raspberry Pi. And if you'll see the back here, it does have this ribbon cable, which came with it. And then there's a spot here for four or five jumpers, and we're going to use four of them. And so we're also going to need some female to female jumper wires. Okay, so I'll just put that here, and then I'll put the jumper wires over to the side. If you are using the touchscreen, you're probably going to want a, an enclosure for the touchscreen, so it's not just kind of like sitting out here. And there's a couple things you could do. The first thing you could do is you could 3D print uh, some little brackets here, like little stands to hold up the touchscreen, uh, which works well. Or you could go ahead and I found this laying around my house, but I think it was like 17 bucks for the enclosure when I did buy it. And the 7 inch touchscreen will go in here and the Raspberry Pi will go here. So it's a nice little self contained unit that you could hang upside down or you could, you know, just set it on your desk and it looks pretty nice on your desk. And that's what I'm going to go with today. And one of the things I should mention is because all this stuff has been laying around my house, I don't know where all the screws are. So in today's episode, I'm only going to be using a minimal amount of screws to hold everything together until I can get to the hardware store to get more supplies. Next up, we're going to need power supplies. And so what we have here is a 2.5 amp power supply. And since, though, I'm using this LCD here, I'm going to need two power supplies, which I'll show you later. So if you're going to use your TV or something, you only need one power supply to power the Pi. And if you're going to use the LCD, you're going to need two power supplies. Just a word about power supplies. Raspberry Pis run on a micro USB. And you might think, hey, I could probably just plug this into any old power supply brick and it'll be fine. Uh, Raspberry Pi does recommend that you use a 5 volt and 2.5 amp for at least a Raspberry Pi 3 power supply. And there is a very good reason for that, which we'll probably see later on. And some of the other things you'll need for the installation, which aren't going to be permanent, are at least a screwdriver. This one's a Phillips head. It's pretty small. Here, I'll show you over here. And then you're going to probably want a USB keyboard and a USB mouse, which we'll get into later, but it just makes the whole process a lot easier. You are going to need some software too, which we'll talk about right now. And so the first piece of software we're going to use, it's going to be... Raspbian or the Raspberry Pi operating system. So this is like Windows. You know, you have a computer and then Windows runs the operating system, which does like all the cool graphical stuff, right? So on the links below, if you go to raspberrypi.org slash downloads, you can go ahead and once you're there, click on this icon here of the little Raspberry and it says Raspberry Pi OS previously called Raspbian. So I click it and once it loads, there's a couple options, but let's go ahead and use the first option, Raspberry Pi OS with a desktop and recommended software. Now I'm going to download the zip file. And while that's downloading, you can see I already had started it earlier. But while it's downloading, 
While it's downloading, we're going to go ahead and find a couple other pieces of software as well. If you have followed along with my other videos, we did use this software, Win32 Disk Imager, in a prior episode where we built a Pi Star, and we're going to need that software again too. So again, if you click on the links below, you'll get to the SourceForge page, which will allow you to download Win32 Disk Imager. And all you got to do is click this download button here. Once you have those two things downloaded, you're going to want to first install Win32 Disk Imager. It should be as simple as double clicking the program and running the installation. Uh, however, if you do have some problems, you could check out my PyStar video where I show you how to install it completely. Once you've finished installing Wind32 Disk Imager, you're going to want to extract the Raspbian operating system image. And in order to do that, you're going to find wherever you downloaded your image to. For me, it's my desktop. For you, it might be your downloads folder. And you're just going to right click on it and click extract here. And what will happen after about four or five minutes, it'll extract this whole image here. This is good and we're gonna need this in just a moment. Let's go ahead now and find your micro SD card. And usually they come with these little adapters here. There we go. And all you gotta do is plug in your little micro SD adapter to the normal uh, SD card and then plug it into your computer. And once you get your micro SD card plugged into your computer, you're gonna wanna open uh, Win32 Disk Imager. And in order to open that, it's going to require admin access. So if you get a screen that says, do you wish to allow admin control or whatever it might be on your computer, click yes. And now you'll see uh, Win32 Disk Imager has opened. Uh, I should also note, and I've noted this in other videos too, when you do this process, I would highly recommend that you do not have any external devices plugged into your computer besides the micro SD card. And what I'm talking about is like external hard drives and stuff because right here you have the option to select a device. I have in the past, unfortunately, wrote over important data that was on a hard drive which was plugged into the computer at the time. So just to avoid all that, you know, just have the micro SD card plugged in. And that's what this is right here, device D. So I'm gonna drop this down and I'm gonna select which device I wanna write to, which for me is gonna be my micro SD card device D. Now I need to select the image file and you cannot drag and drop it like I'm trying to do. So you actually have to click the folder and then find the image. And when I click the folder and I select the image, I'll now see that the image file name is listed here and there's not too much else I need to worry about except clicking the right button. So that's what I'm gonna do now. I click right and it says, hey, writing to a physical device can corrupt this device. And this goes back to probably don't have your external hard drives plugged in. Are you sure you wanna continue? Well, I have triple checked. I don't have any external hard drives plugged in, only the micro SD card and it is device D. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna click yes. And now the progress of writing this device. So this device is writing and it's going to take about 10 minutes, but Whew, got lost in the matrix there. But once it is complete, this box here will actually show that the write was complete and successful. And unfortunately, my computer crashed, <laughs> so it doesn't show that in mine. But yours will say write successful and you can just click OK and exit the program. What I do want to show you is what's on that boot device that we made for the Raspberry Pi because you might actually need to change some things in there depending on what your setup's going to be. What I would recommend is don't do anything for now and see what happens. And then if you need to make some changes, you can make them in here. And let me show you what I'm talking about. For the Raspberry Pi touchscreen 7 inch, you have uh, the unfortunate, whatever you want to call it, of this possibly being upside down once everything is complete. And so if you do find that that's gonna be the case, uh, you're gonna probably wanna make some changes. So the screen is inverted and correct to you. Uh, so what you could do is you could open up the folder where the boot disk is, or you could open up your SD drive. Uh, so what I do is I open it up and I find this config.txt file. Here it is. If I go all the way to the bottom, I'm just gonna add this one line, LCD underscore rotate equals, and every line I found on, excuse me, every article I found online said, hey, set it to two. Well, that value wasn't working for me, so I quickly realized that these values, depending on what you want, uh, you're going to have to change them. So, for example, one worked for me, and it completely inverted the, the screen the way I needed it to be. But you might have to play around with those values a little bit if you're having a problem. 
Now, I will tell you that most people on like an LED TV or an LCD TV with HDMI won't see this problem. Another thing that I am paying attention to is the frame buffer width and height. I may need to change those later. So I'll go ahead and I'm going to exit out of here. It's going to ask me, do you want to save? And I'm going to click save. And then I'm going to go ahead and close this folder. And now comes the time where we could take the SD card out of the computer and we're going to start playing with the Raspberry Pi and getting everything put together. So the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to take your SD card out of the actual S micro SD card adapter, throw that to the side, and then find your Raspberry Pi. Now that you have your Raspberry Pi, you're going to go ahead and you're going to plug in your SD card to the back of the Raspberry Pi. And now on the bottom, you'll see a housing unit. And generally, the contacts on this should be down facing the Raspberry Pi. And the text should be up. So it should go in. It's not going to go in all the way, per se. But if you flip it over and try to plug it in, it's definitely not going to go in all the way. So don't try to force it. You'll break your uh, SD card and maybe your Raspberry Pi. And once it's in, go ahead and set that to the side for just a moment. Put it right there. And now that we have this sitting over here nicely watching over us, we're going to bring the LCD up here. And on the back of the LCD, you have the control board. Well, there are five pins here for the jumper wires that I mentioned earlier. But we only need to use four of the jumper wires. So the first jumper wire we need to use uh, is the five volt jumper wire. And you could color coordinate these, but for the sake of this tutorial, I'm just going to be plugging in. here. So I have five volts here, and this jumper wire is not going to go anywhere yet. Uh, the next one we're going to use is going to be SDA. So we're skipping INT, and we're going to SDA. And then we're going to plug in the rest, S, C, L, and G, N, D, or ground. So Again, actually, you know, I know I said it, I'm just going to put them in any way, but I'm going to put the red wire on 5 volts. Um, and then we're going to do ground for the ground. And finally, I need one more. I have an orange one here, so we'll use the orange for SCL. So again, here you are. You have 5 volts, SDA, SCL, and ground. And as of right now, they don't go anywhere. If you haven't already plugged in your ribbon cable, which, like I said, mine's pretty beat up. It looks like it's got a couple stains here and everything, but it still works. So if you haven't done that, go ahead and plug it in now. Uh, an important note here is the contacts on the actual board are going to be facing up. Now that should slide lightly into place, and it isn't going to go very far down, but don't force it. It's a very sensitive cable, even though mine is beat up. And once it's in place, all you have to do is lock these two sides down and then the cable will be secure and so once you have your lcd here and you have these four jumpers plugged in and your ribbon cable plugged in we're going to actually want to start putting this in our case now and this is going to be a little bit difficult on camera because i'm working with limited space but here is my case on the front of the case and then here is my lcd now what i'm going to want to do is i'm going to want to make sure my ribbon cable is facing to the right so my ribbon cable here is closest to the right hand side of this case. And then what's going to happen is it's going to be able to nicely sit into these four little holes here. Let me do that now. Actually, you know, one of the other things I want to talk about real quick is this hole here. So once you get this into or almost in a position, you're going to want to run the jumper wires through this hole right here. And then you're going to also want to put the ribbon cable through there. Once you get the cables actually through, go ahead and kind of let this thing fall into place. And I already can tell that mine's not fully seated, as you can see as well. And the reason for that might be I need to pull these cables on the back out just ever so slightly. I'm going to be very gentle with it. And when I do that, then this falls into place. I went ahead and I skipped a step or two just so... We can make the video go faster, but all it was was plugging in these screws, which again aren't the right size screws for this device, and I'll fix that later. Uh, but now that the screws are plugged in, we need to concentrate about plugging in the wires. And so what we want to do is we want to find out which wires we used in which slots, and then we also want to find out where they need to go into the Raspberry Pi. Now in order to do that, here is a little graph, and I'll provide a link below, but this is on Raspberry Pi's website. This little graph here actually shows where 5 volts located, where ground's located, where SDA and where SL or SCL is located. And those are the four that we want to concentrate on. So 
Uh, if you're looking at this device, you start counting the pin numbers from the upper left of this uh, device. And so pin one is three volts and pin two is five volts and so forth. Uh, let me go ahead and cut over here. So again, this will be pin one, pin two, pin three, pin four, and so on. The first thing we want to do is we want to plug in our red wire, which was our five volts, into the five volt section of the Raspberry Pi. Now, we also know that ground was going to be brown. And so that's just going to go into the ground section. Now, if I look again, one, two, three, four, five, six, pin six, which is right here, is ground. Now we need to figure out which one is SDA and which one is SCL. So in order to do that, hopefully we remembered which two wires it was. But if we didn't, we can always unscrew this and look at the wires and see what we plugged into where. And as you can see, I now have all four wires plugged in and I need to get this ribbon cable plugged in. Well, there's only one way the ribbon cable could go without twisting the cable and you don't want to do that. So the contacts will be facing the ports or the USB ports of the device. And as the contacts are facing down and toward those ports, just make sure that this little ribbon port is up and it's going to be this one and not this one. It's going to be this one right here. And then slowly just Again, put that in, and once it's in place, the two little clamps on the side will go down, and this thing is secured. So again, we have our jumper wires plugged in to the GPIO pins, and that's what these are called right here. And then we have our ribbon cable plugged in. So, with any luck, we should now be ready to get this thing started up and get everything configured in the Raspberry Pi itself for the ham clock. In order to get everything plugged in and running now, we need to plug in our keyboard. If you're going to use a mouse, plug in your mouse, and any of these ports will do. And then after you plug those in, go ahead and plug in your power. Now if you're running this touchscreen device, again, you're going to have two power ports, and I'll show you here where they are. There's one power port here for the Raspberry Pi, and one power port here for the LCD. So now I'm plugged in, and it's still not working. What's the deal with that? Well. Again, you can only see there's one power cable here. I mentioned you have to have two, one to power the LCD and one to power the actual Raspberry Pi. So I'm gonna plug this in now. Now that I have both cables plugged in, I notice that there's two lights on the Raspberry Pi. And if I were to flip this over now, I'm gonna see that this device is booting up. And let me go ahead and fix the issue with the contrast while it's booting. And so what I did is I went ahead and I popped up the Raspberry Pi as you should see it after it boots up. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through this Raspberry Pi setup. So you're probably not going to have an IP address here quite yet. You're still going to have to set that up. But let me show you how to do all that. Go ahead and click next. And it's going to ask you things like your country information. So go ahead and fill this out. And our time zone. And I'm going to use the English language and a US keyboard. And then I'm going to click next. Now it's going to set up the location and it's going to take a moment. Once it's done configuring the language and the keyboard usage, it's going to ask you for a new password. And this is very important. If you leave the standard password for the Raspberry Pi, it becomes susceptible to hacking. So you're going to want to change it. The default password, well, the default username is Pi, P I, and the default password is Raspberry, all lowercase. But we're going to go ahead and change the password to something that you'll remember. And then go ahead and click the next button. Now it says setup screen. The desktop should fill the entire screen. Tick the box below if your screen has a black border around the edges. I look at my touch screen and I notice it does not have any borders that they mentioned. So I'm just going to go ahead and click next. And now it's going to search for wireless networks. As I mentioned, mine's already set up, but what you're going to do is, once it finds the network, you're going to click on it and click the next button. And now it's going to tell you, hey, we need to update all the information or all the operating system files if it hasn't already been updated. So go ahead and click next, and this process will take just a couple of minutes. Once everything finished, you should see a system is up to date message, and if you click OK, It'll now give you some other options. It says your Raspberry Pi is now set up and ready to go. To run the applications, click the Raspberry Pi and so forth. It does say that you need to restart your Pi for the settings to take place, and I'm going to click later, but you should probably restart now.
Now that we are in our Raspberry Pi, we need to start downloading the files for the ham clock. To do so, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to open up this little window here, which is called Terminal. And once Terminal loads, we need to type some stuff into this black box, this command prompt. And once we're in the command prompt, you're going to need to put in some commands. And if you check in the description below, I went ahead and provided a link to dl1gkk.com where he talks about the process to install everything. So if you like to read the tutorial as you're going through, that'll be the site you look at. And there he mentions that you're going to need to type in this command, curl-o, esphamclock.zip, http, and so forth. So go ahead and type that in, or copy and paste it as I did, and hit enter. Once you hit enter, you see it is uh, downloading something now, and the download is pretty quick. Once it's down, excuse me, once it's done downloading, you're going to unzip the file by typing unzip, and then the file name that we created, ESP Ham Clock. As you can see, it did inflate and extract all the files, and now we're going to go ahead and we need to go into that directory. So if you change directory, and I see my caps lock is on, and then ESP ham clock. And you might be wondering, how did I type that so fast? Well, if I'm changing the directory, and I could actually hit the tab button, and I could see a list of files that are located in the directory I'm at. So I could type ES and then hit the tab button, and it'll auto-complete it for me. So change directory, ESP ham clock, and hit enter. Now we're in the ESP ham clock directory and we need to make this file. So the tutorial says, hey, you're going to make dash J4 ham clock. Now, again, the four is going to be one of those things that will need to be changed based on the device you're using. So, for example, this option could be one, two, three, four, five, and so forth. But if I type in make help, it's actually going to show me a list of what that's doing, that 4 is doing. So if I chose number 1, it would give me a resolution of 800 by 480, 1600 by 960 if I chose 2, and so forth. Uh, for the sake of this tutorial, I'm going to go ahead and I don't know exactly which one it's going to be, but I am going to choose 1 because my device is, my 7-inch touchscreen is an 800 by 480 DPI. And if this doesn't work, which I'm expecting it not to work, I could show you later how to change it. Here we are now, and it is basically making everything, and this will take a few minutes again. And while this is installing, it's a perfect time to say, hey, don't forget to subscribe to Ham Radio Dude and like this video if it's helpful. And as you can see, now we're actually done installing ham clock. So what we need to do is hit a period and then a forward slash and type in ham clock. Once you do that, go ahead and hit enter. And all of a sudden you see a awesome window pop up on the screen that's asking you for some call sign information. But boy, that looks ugly, right? Because the menu bar is up on top and... You know, things just don't look completely right. So let's first do this. Let's right click somewhere where there's an open space on the menu and go down to panel settings. And from panel settings, once it loads up the preferences, you're going to click on this tab that says advanced. And then I minimize this panel when not in use and I click close. So now that panel goes away and I could actually bring this ham clock application up a little bit. And it still kind of looks weird because there's that title bar up here, but I can keep dragging that title bar up so it's actually kind of like out of the screen and eventually you'll find a spot that you think it looks pretty decent where it's at so that's where I'm at right now and so now it's asking me to go ahead and type in my call sign I'm gonna type in W and then 9 and then F F F and I'm gonna click done once you click done it'll go through a menu saying that it's configuring your network and so forth and after just a couple of seconds you're gonna be presented with the ham clock Congratulations, you've installed Ham Clock for the most part. There are a couple little tweaks we could do to make things a little bit better, but you now have the Ham Clock where you can click on your call sign or click on the background for your call sign to make things look different. You can click on the moon 
to show a picture of the the earth or the sun and so forth and basically you have your time in utc your local time and whatnot so everything seems to be working so that's how to install ham clock from essentially start to the point where you get ham clock working now there are a couple things that you might want to do within the raspberry pi operating system like disable your screensaver which you can go to the Raspberry Pi icon and preferences and under display, there should be an option there to disable the screensaver. And basically what that'll do is allow you to not have the screen blank out after a certain amount of time. For example, I want my ham clock to run all the time. I don't want it to go blank after 10 minutes. So that's uh, something you could do. You know, you could work on startup scripts and everything like that too. So if ham clock is going to be the only thing you're using this device for, it would just load up ham clock automatically. And then you don't even have to worry about startup scripts and everything. Now, another problem you might run into is after you installed it and you reboot the computer, if you don't even have an automatic startup script on there, how do you reopen ham clock? Well, you can create a shortcut on your desktop that links to the install that we did. Now, there's a lot you could do. The link I provided with the tutorial of ham clock, it has all the information there. And if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. And in fact, just check out the comments below anyway, because a lot of people add on things like tips and tricks regarding what they did to have an ideal setup or some of their tweaks and modifications. Uh, they talk about certain things like what did or didn't work for them. And so you might have a question that is answered in the comments. But until next time, guys, I'm W9FFF Ham Radio Dude. I had a good time making this video and I hope you enjoyed it. 73.